All right. All right, I went ahead and got the recording started. Um, the uh, This computer is being a little wonky on me, so bear with me on that. Um, let me start off, sign-in sheet. Hold on, hold on, hold on for a sec. <laughs> All right, um, let's talk a little bit about some housekeeping. So um, today, uh, if you actually look at the syllabus, I actually swapped some things around. We were supposed to talk about uh, some uh, things about the corporate environment and you know, billability and, and contracts and things like that. We were supposed to talk about that today, but I'm actually not going to be here next week. Um, so between what we were going to talk about this week and what we were supposed to talk about next week, um, I made a, a – I don't know what – what, what happened there. Um, between the two of them, I kind of thought this topic was more important. A, it directly relates to an assignment that you all are going to get today, and B, I mean, it, it's ethics, so I thought it was kind of important. So we're going to talk about ethics today. Don't worry, I, I don't think it's going to be, uh, I think you'll, you'll find it somewhat interesting. So there's going to be a writing assignment associated with it. All right, everybody, everybody, come on, calm down, calm down. All right. Um, there's going to be a writing assignment associated with this. There's going to be a paper that you all do. Um, I've posted that today, and we'll talk about that near the end. Um, the, the paper is due Wednesday, October 11th. You submit that via Blackboard. We'll talk about uh, that case later on. Don't forget your uh, resume. It's due on October 25th. Um, a couple of you have already submitted one, and that's fine, but just don't forget about it. I am going to bring it up each week. So Lecture 5 is canceled. I'm going to post that on YouTube, so I'll have a little recording on corporate environments and professionalism. Week 6. Week 6, uh, we will meet in Drinko 402. So we are not going to be in here again. We're going to be in Drinko. So next week, we're not going to meet uh, physically. We'll just, I'll just do a video on YouTube. Week 6, Drinko. That's our last lecture in Drinko, by the way. So, uh, so no worries on that. Uh, we're going to have some folks from Marshall Career Services come and talk about uh, uh, the resources and whatnot that they have available. Is everybody okay on housekeeping? Okay. Um, so today, uh, what I want to talk to you all about is ethics. Now, this is arguably one of the least technical presentations or lectures I've ever given because there's no equations or anything like that, which as a structural engineer, it just seems odd. There's no, there's no equations. What, what, what's, what's, what's up with that? Yeah, this is, yeah, come on. Yeah, pseudoscience. <laughs> this, oh, goodness. All right. I do think this is kind of important. Um, the, there are some, uh, I don't want to say gray areas, but there are some situations where um, it is very clear that an action needs to be taken, but maybe you're not sure which action needs to be taken. I mean, you know, if you're on a, uh, uh, a construction site and your job as the intern is to test the slump, and you know the slump is supposed to be between, let's say, one and three inches, and it comes out and it's 0.9 inches, do you call the National Safety Board? Like, Probably not, you know, but you, but you do need to probably notify someone. Maybe it's just the foreman, maybe it's your boss, I, I don't know. But um, I, I think there are some very obvious um, uh, decisions that need to be made, but I want to make sure that you understand not just your general responsibilities, but some strategies that you should take that meet your ethical requirements, but um, also take into account the real world a little bit. Um, so I think a good place to start, and the reason why we talk about this, is to just very briefly kind of you know, talk about professional life in general. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about engineering ethics, but I want to sort of, you know, lay it out very generally. I mean, I want to start off by talking about what is a profession. I mean, is a, uh, um, a job as a uh, convenience store clerk a profession? I argue probably not. Um, I've been a convenience store clerk, so I, I can say that. Um, but I would argue something like being an attorney, that's a profession. 
being uh, an engineer, that's a profession. What are some other examples you think of some professions out there? A doctors, nurses. What else? Teachers. So it's, so it's going to be like that already. That was on that. Okay. You didn't need to, yeah. <laughs> Let's try another one. And I'm not calling on you. <laughs> Anything else? Come on. We're just having fun. I mean, come on. Any other professions you could think of? Oh, goodness. Maybe being an accountant? One, being a CPA. Anything else you can think of? Being a police officer. There we go. So, so I'm being a, being a lawyer, being an attorney. Um, mostly, uh, the the big uh, uh, the big thing that defines a profession is that you need some some specialized, advanced training. I mean, to uh, to be an engineer, you can't just um, you know, graduate high school and say I'm an engineer, it requires training, it requires education, it requires a license, you know. That's, there's a lot of work that goes into becoming a professional engineer. Everybody sign in? What? Okay. Who didn't sign in? Raise your hand real high. Real high. All right. So just this row. Okay. You all just got skipped over. Okay. So what are ethics? Um, uh, I would like to tell you all a, a little story. And in, in order to, in order to uh, maintain confidentiality, I'm not going to mention any names, but I think this is a really important story, and I think we can um, uh, have some general discussion about what ethics really mean. So how many of you um, have ever heard or, or, or know anything about like a, a great appeals process or heard anything about that? Okay, so um, now great appeals processes, um, can involve many things. They can involve, you know, somebody like me gives you a B and you think you deserve an A. Um, it can involve, you know, you know, getting incompletes resolved. But one of the more contentious um, things that great appeals boards solve is, the, okay. one of the more contentious things that great appeals committees solve is, well, what happens if somebody is accused of cheating? Okay. Now, when I was an undergrad, I, when I was an undergrad. I was actually, I served on the Great Appeals Committee. Um, I was one of the people that, that reviewed Great Appeals. And, and that's actually not that uncommon. Um, depending upon the, uh, uh, the university, some universities' Great Appeals boards are just professors. Some of them, they are a combination of professors, administrators, and students. Go to UVA, it's just students, okay? So it's just students. And um, so I was the student rep, or one of the student reps that served on the Great Appeals Board. And we got a very interesting case once. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm maintaining confidentiality to try and uh, to try and keep this straightforward. But I, I thought this would be a very interesting story. So we had a, a student uh, in in a class. It was a, a criminal justice class who um, was accused of cheating. And what happened was the class um, was. I'll make up the time. I think it was like from 11 to 12, and from 10 to 11, the room was empty. Now, this is one of those classes where the professor had assigned seats, so everybody was sitting, you know, where they sat throughout the semester. Student walks into the room. Now, what I'm saying now, this is not debated. This is a fact. The student walked into the room about an hour before the uh, test began and started writing notes in pencil on the desk. All right. 10.50 comes around. Student leaves. I think maybe to make a phone call or use the restroom or something, I don't know. Well, here's where things get interesting. So, the pr no, <laughs> base, basically this is what's going to happen, yeah. Well, um, what happened was the, um, the professor uh, couldn't make it uh, and uh, called a TA to come in and actually proctor the exam. The TA had taken the class and certainly knew what was going on, so the TA comes in and starts putting tests on the desk. And boo! Oh, there's that. TA knew what it was, and the TA sort of panicked, and 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 made up a little bit of a fib and said something like they're doing plumbing work or electrical work on on uh, in the adjacent room, 
So I asked everybody that was on sort of like these first two rows to sort of move over. The, the person walks in and had written all this stuff on the desk and ends up seated all the way on the other side of the room. Takes the test from start to finish, start to finish, turns it in, leaves. TA calls the professor, professor comes in, they take the desk, pick it up, sit it on top of a Xerox machine. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. Xeroxed the desk. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> and, and, um, <laughs> what's that? No, no, no. They, they, because it was the desk, they knew who it was because it was assigned seating. So they found the person. The student was in like biology lab or something later that day, and they pulled him out of the biology lab, and they said, hey, what's the deal? And he made the, the argument, I didn't cheat. I was over there, start to finish. So it wound up on our plate. And, you know, the appeals board, they asked, so why were you writing the notes on the desk? And he said, um, so the way that I study is by writing things down, and I didn't have any paper with me, so I just, <laughs> so I just wrote on the desk. Now, what got interesting, uh, what got interesting was when he left, we had a very sort of intense debate within the committee as to whether or not the student cheated. Does the intent to cheat equate to cheating? Okay. Well, we'll we'll get into that. We'll get into that, and 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I will answer that in the end. Well, let me ask you a question. I'm curious what you all think. How many of you think that this kid cheated? What's that? <laughs> Interesting. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you think? that he acted in an academically dishonest fashion. Oh, okay. All right. This is interesting. This is interesting. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. This is interesting, okay, because the myself and the uh, engineering faculty on the committee, we kind of said the same thing, and this is the reason why we said it. Um, the, what we wanted to have answered was we went to the, the, the catalog of the university and we, we looked up the definition of cheating and the definition of academic dishonesty, because if we were going to accuse this person of, of cheating, we wanted to ensure that we were following along with what the university said was the definition, and we didn't feel that the um, uh, we didn't feel that the, the the student's actions met the definition. Now, let me let me just pull the room. How many of you think that the student acted in an unethical fashion? Everybody thinks that because here here's the interesting part. Here's the interesting part. Whether you take the side as to whether or not this student should be found guilty or should be found innocent in a legal setting. We still be, we agree that he acted unethically. Un, ethics is sort of the the, the 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 saber that cuts through all of that you know um, that theory and gets into whether the action was right or wrong. Now the funny part was, and, and I'll, I'll sort of close this. This is where the engineer in me came uh, came into play. Um, the the sanctions that were uh, available to us were you know we could have graded the test as is. Uh, we could have given the student a zero on the test, a zero in the class. You know, there were very, you know, varying degrees of sanctions. The long and short of it was, the student did so bad on the test. It really, the engineer in me said, doesn't really matter what sanction we pass. This is all going to mean the same thing. So the engineer in me said, you know, uh, but I'll tell, I'll tell you one thing. One of the the um, the faculty uh, in, on in another college made a comment in the in the debate because the class and I didn't say this to the end the class was a criminal justice ethics class <laughs> and and one of the faculty kept going on and on about 
well, you know, it, what makes it even worse was that it was an ethics class. I said, hold on here, hold on. You're telling me that if a student cheats in steel design, that it's not the same thing than if a student cheats in ethics, that one class is more valuable than another? And I started to get really heated about that because the, the professor was actually trying to sway the committee that, this, that our punishments should be more severe because of the content of the class. I said, no, you know. I mean, would you say the same thing about a steel design class, or what about a, a, a class on pharmacology, you know, or, or you know, a case law, or, or something like that? Oh, good. <laughs> now that's the engineer coming. <laughs> Look, somebody walks in and goes. That was the test. <laughs> I told you this would be an interesting lecture. <laughs> I told you all you would get a kick out of this. Um, so yeah, um, what is what are what are ethics? Okay, ethics are essentially general rules and patterns for which we should behave. You know, it all stems from the uh, you know the golden rule. You know, do unto others as they would do unto you. But but in the end. Um, and it's fundamentally founded, you know, to make sure that we are concerning not just for ourselves but for others. But where it gets interesting is when you start talking about a given profession. And um, I want to bring up a, a particular point. I want to bring up a particular point about engineering, okay? I'm sure that by now you all could quote by heart what is the primary responsibility of an engineer. It's to ensure the safety and welfare of the public, right? I think by now, if you, if you didn't know that, I would hope you did. Yep. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> you should know that. Okay, well now you've heard it. I'll say it again. Our primary responsibility when we design a dam, a bridge, a building, a highway, what have you. Our primary responsibility has to, you know, we have to ensure that the, way, the safety and the welfare of the public has been met. I would not be behaving uh, ethically or in my charge as an engineer if I designed a bridge that I knew could potentially collapse, okay? That would not be ethical behavior, okay? okay? But here's where um, it gets interesting with engineers, okay? Let, let me ask a question. Let's go back to steel design or reinforced concrete design, because I know just about everybody in here uh, has had one of those classes. Um, let's talk about uncertainties, okay? Remember how there's always uncertainties associated in the design process? Remember, um, you know, if I've got dead loads and live loads, you know, I'm more certain about the estimation of dead loads on a structure than I am live loads or you know, then we can go into things like wind and earthquakes and whatnot. And then I'm also uncertain about resistance. Remember my, you know, if I break this table, it's got a capacity. What if I break every table in the room? There's going to be some scatter, right? All right. Um, no, that's fine. Um, what I'm getting at is there are uncertainties associated with the design process. And then we got into the discussion of the bell curve and normal distributions, right? And we said, well, no structure is perfectly safe. Right? That doesn't exist. That's not possible. There's always some level of risk. It's always about what's an acceptable level of risk. So we, so now here's where it gets interesting because we as engineers must ensure the safety and the welfare of the public, but at the same time we recognize the fact that there's always risk involved. There's, it's unavoidable, right? So that's where, you know, your judgment and, and your responsibility to society uh, come into play. Okay? Now, you know, First off, where do you start? Um, you know, if you've got an ethical dilemma, oh, what do you do? You call a friend, you know. I mean, what, you know, uh, do you ask another engineer? Do you ask your supervisor? Just meditate on it a little while. Um, depending upon the issue, whether or not confidentiality is a problem or not, that might, you know, some of these might not be a a, a bad strategy. But I do want to talk a little bit about some codes of ethics. Now, if you look on Blackboard, first off, if you haven't already logged in, go ahead and do so. I posted two codes of ethics. Um, let's see. 
Yes, he had the sign, man. Okay. Not that. Code of ethics. Okay. Now, this is the code of ethics for the National Society of Professional Engineers. And this one is more geared towards really just engineering in general, regardless of whether you're a civil engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, uh, what have you. And I want to take some time and sort of, um, uh, I, I want to go through each of these one at a time. Uh, I want to start off by, by talking about the fundamental canons. Okay? These are fundamental parameters by which we as engineers uh, uh, should operate. So number one, we hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. Okay? That's number one. Okay, but let's talk about number two. Perform services only in their areas of competence. You will not see me designing a water wastewater treatment process. Just isn't happening. Okay, I don't know about that. You will, you know, my area is structural engineering. You all are aware of that, so that's where I, uh, that's where I operate. Okay, if we issue public statements, only, only issue them in a objective and truthful manner. Okay, you know, truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, right? Um, act for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. Okay, so that means maintaining confidentiality. You know, if you're an engineer at firm A and then you get a job at engineering firm B, that doesn't. I mean, we're going to give all your secret, give all their secrets away to the to your competitor. Uh, you got, you can't do that. Avoid deceptive acts. I think that's pretty reasonable. Conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. Okay? These are fundamental cans. I think these are pretty straightforward. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about some of these more specific ones. Um, okay, so for instance, engineers shall hold uh, paramount the safety and health and welfare of the public. So these are some, some a little bit more specific guidelines. Like for instance, if engineers' judgment is overruled under circumstances that endanger life or property, and we're going to talk about you know, some cases today where this might kind of be the case, um, they shall notify their employer or client uh, and such other authority as may be appropriate. You know, If you're working on a project and you see that something being done is being done in an unsafe manner, and just sit there and do something about it. You know? um, you know, engineers shall not aid or abet the unlawful practice of, of engineering by a person or firm. You know, if you see something going wrong, you can't obviously you can't um, uh, adhere to that. Engineers shall approve only those engineering documents that are in conformity with applicable standards. You know, making sure they're using the most recent and up-to-date specifications. Um, <coughs> I am not going to sit here and go through every single one of these. Um, this is not a long document. It is only two pages. But what I will say about this is this. So uh, a little bit on your writing assignment. So here's the deal with your writing assignment. Um, I'm presenting to you a case on your writing assignment. It's about two pages long. First off, this isn't, um, this isn't like a real case. Like you'll see it's about, you know, this let, you know, for instance, there's a number of people involved. Like for instance, Julie Adams. Julie Adams is not a real person. It's just a, it's a narrative. So I'm sure there's a Julie Adams out there somewhere, but um, this is, you know, this is a narrative. It, it's a, it's a story, if you will. But this is a story involving a structural engineer and a structural forensic investigation of a building while it's being sold. And after you read the narrative, the question that is asked at the end is, what do you do if you were in their shoes? Okay. And and what I am after is, is you all are going to write a. a you know, an essay um, going into this, I don't want you to say, well, if I was in her position, here's what I would do because that's how I feel. I want you to say, here's what I would do based on, you know, 2-4-A or 2-5-C. you know, 5C. I want you to use the canons of ethics as a backup for what you are saying. Does, does that make sense? So I'm not saying you need to, I, you honestly should read this, but you're really going to need to use it more as justification for your argument that you're making in your paper. And, and let me also say this. I don't know, I mean this is a really intricate case. I don't know that there's really a wrong answer, but again what I'm going to base my grading on is not so much, you know, 
what your answer is. I mean, you know, you might read this and you might genuinely say they shouldn't do anything. Maybe they've already done enough. That may be reasonable if you can back it up. You see what I mean? So I want your strategy for the folks involved in this story to be backed up by canons of ethics. Does that make sense? So I do want you to take some time and, and review this. Now this is the uh, NSPE code of ethics. I also have posted the uh, the ASCE one. We're civil engineers, so so <coughs> you know we have our seven uh, fundamental canons for ASCE. We shall hold say, uh, paramount the safety and welfare of the public. We shall perform services only in our areas of competence, uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of it's very similar. Um, I, I'm not really uh, you know, if you can back up your, your case with one uh, code of ethics or both code of ethics, uh, that's fine. Um, let's see. Any questions so far? We'll, we'll get into some of this stuff as we move on. Oh, okay. So first off, you know, talking about these codes of ethics, they are a framework for you to make your judgment, but they are not a substitute for judgment. Hence why I say, I don't know that there's really a wrong answer for any of these uh, uh, cases. Again, what I am most concerned about is that your answer is backed up, okay? They are not a substitute for sound judgment. They're also not a legal document. And you, really, you can't really get arrested for uh, violating an ethics code. Now, you can be kicked out of a society. You can be sanctioned by a licensing board. You know, they can take that action and make a decision based on it. Um, but I really want you to understand that there's a difference between violating ethics and violating the law. Um, I do want to talk about, and I'm not going to get into ethical or theory, you know, crazy ethical theories or philosophy or anything like that, but I do want you to understand some situational uh, uh, interpretations of ethics. Some of them have validity in certain situations, some of them don't. I mean, first off, you know, we're really going to be talking about um, uh, what we're really going to be talking about in here is professional ethics. You know, how, sh how should you behave uh, when dealing with a client, when dealing with your firm or your company, when dealing with the government? I mean, we're talking about professional situations in here. I mean, it stands to reason. I mean, you know, there's uh, uh, situations where professional ethics is important, and there's situations where personal ethics are important. You know, you dealing with your peers and your friends. Um, you know, one-on-one -on -one type relationships. We're really not talking about that in here, but it's definitely something that's, uh, that's worth mentioning. Now, there is a big difference between ethics and the law, okay? So something can be considered legal and then arguably considered unethical at the same time. You know, uh, designing a, a, a process to release some, you know, toxic gas into the atmosphere, probably legal, uh, actually doing it or using it's probably unethical, you know, and this type of stuff can get really interesting. I mean, we could have some really interesting debates in here. Is it ethical to design a gun? You know, think about it, right? Is it ethical? I, I, you know, that's an interesting, interesting topic to bring up, you know? Somebody will say something like, oh, well, well you know, we're just talking about hunting. Okay, well, is it ethical to design an anti-aircraft gun? Uh, the Mark III, not the Mark IV, yeah. I'm probably not willing to, so. What's that? I'm not talking about Mark <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we'll have to ask Tony Stark about that one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, these are some really interesting questions as to whether or not something's legal or something ethical. Something can be ethical, but it could be illegal. I mean, maybe you're a doctor and, and there's some drug that you know will save somebody's life, but you know if you administer it, it hasn't yet received approval. You're the one who did the research and development on it. Do you give the person the drug and help them save their life? You know, it's interesting. You know, you really need to consider this. So um, let's talk about uh, some, some basic ethical theories because I do want you to kind of have a general idea of where some of this stuff comes from. So utilitarianism, uh, it's, it, it, you know, some of these, these ethical theories and these, these ways of, of um, of approaching these problems are really to try and develop a process that can be a one-size-fits-all for any given situation. That usually doesn't work 
but they can help describe different points of view that you can take. So a utilitarian uh, will, will choose the, um, the option that produces the most utility for every, everyone involved, you know, maximize human well-being, society well-being. So for instance, uh, if you're building a dam uh, for, you know, to collect drinking water, uh, flood control, uh, things like that, yeah, that generally helps society, but what about the, the few individuals who own that property who are losing property? It's one of those situations where not everybody wins. But a utilitarian would say, well, build the dam. That's going to help more people. You know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, to quote Spock, right, from Star Trek. There's, there's not many, many Star Trek fans in here. OK, there we go. Live long and prosper. All right. So, so this is where, like, the world in, in engineering, this is where, like, cost-benefit analysis would come in. And I want you to remember that in the back of your head because we're going to talk about the Ford Pinto case. Um, have you all heard of the Ford Pinto case? Okay. That, what's that? Okay. Well, we, if you haven't, you will. And the Ford Pinto case is definitely involves interpretations of utilitarianism. And I'm also going to, you know, you all probably know the general gist of the, the Ford Pinto case. If you know about it, I'm going to tell you about some things behind the scenes that you might not know. So, inter interesting stuff. All right. Duty ethics, okay? These are, this is the theory that says, no matter what, do the right thing, you know? These are the duties that need to be performed regardless because these uh, lead to the most good. So, you know, uh, being very rigid uh, in your policies because this is the policy that applies to everyone. I mentioned this, and, and I, um, uh, this, this is kind of a funny, funny story. And, and those of you who have TA'd, uh, been teaching assistants before, and waited weeks and weeks on timesheets and whatnot, we'll definitely get, get a kick out of this. Um, I was a, a graduate student at WVU, and, I, and um, uh, I, I began to learn the very fun process of turning in travel settlements to a government organization. Fun, fun, fun. Um, and, and, you know, some of the policies that I had to uh, uh, deal with, and I still deal with, you know, here as a government employee at Marshall, is, you know, you have to provide, you know, original receipts. You know, for instance, if I, um, uh, if, I, if I travel and I have a, a, a parking fee, I have to provide the receipt. You know, uh, the university won't reimburse me if I don't have a receipt. And that's a completely reasonable, you know, uh, uh, position to take. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this was interesting. When I was a, um, a graduate student at WVU, I had a very similar situation, and I had a parking receipt. Um, now, how many, it was on, you know, like that contact paper, you know, like, you know, that sort of cheap receipt contact paper. What, have you ever seen a receipt like that after six months or eight months? What's it look like? It's, there's, it's blank because the receipt fades. And, the, and so I, I, you know, I had, a, I had been burned once before, so I, I, had, I made a copy of it. And I turned, and I had the copy, and I had it scanned and whatnot. When I turned it in, I, I gave him the hard copy, and I gave him the, the, the PDF, and then it, got lost in, you know, email land, you know how that goes. And, and they go, well, you needed to provide a receipt. I said, Sarah, and they go, this is blank. I said, look at the date when I turned it in. I turned it in in March. It's November. <laughs> of course it's blank. <laughs> now, so what I mean by duty ethics is if company policy required original receipts to justify, um, uh, you know, reimbursement on a given item and you provided a photocopy, uh, somebody who believed in duty ethics would say, it's not an original copy. I'm not giving you the, the reimbursement. There are situations where that's appropriate, you know, having a policy and sticking to it, you know, making sure that you're treating everyone fairly. I don't think it's a, 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 a you know, it's one of those, those theories that always works because I just presented a scenario where that's not really fair to the person who did everything that they're supposed to do. You know, contact paper fades. Now you don't have the doc documentation. So, you know, it's something to consider. Okay, rights ethics, you know, declaration of independence. So we all have uh, certain unalienable rights that don't go away and that we need to respect those. You know, so the ultimate overall good, it generally, um, uh, it do, it's not taken into account. This is sort of maybe the opposite of that whole utilitarianism, you know, concept, you know, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Well, a rights ethics would say, well, you can't ignore the needs and rights of the few. They have rights too. 
So the rights of the property owner for somebody who believed in rights ethics, uh, the rights of the property owner would be uh, paramount to the needs of the dam because they have rights too. And there are situations where that's valid as well. I mean, you can't uh, respect the rights of most, you know, rights and, and, and pri uh, privileges of most people, but just ignore the, the rights of some. That's not right either. So I I'm presenting these, these uh, theories that all have a place, but again, they don't substitute sound judgment, okay? So it's just something to think, uh, keep in mind. So a couple other theories, I mean, and a lot of this stuff comes from, from cultural and, and, and uh, religious uh, areas. You know, there's, there's other, you know, like Chinese uh, ethical theories and Indian uh, ethical theories. I'm not going to get into every different ethical theory that's out there. I just want to present different modes and different ways of thinking about the problems that we as engineers face. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to all this. It requires a little bit of your judgment. Um, you know, morality versus codes of professional responsibility. You know, um, everybody in this room uh, has different religious beliefs, has different social networks, has different cultural backgrounds, has different political ideologies. I do like the fact that the ethics is one of those things that does sort of cut through that. That, that example that I talked about earlier about the student on my, uh, my grade appeals committee. Everybody in this room said, well, regardless of whether or not, you know, he, he, you know, violated the rule or not, or, you know, should we fail him in the class, should we give him a zero on the test, should we grade the test, everybody in the room said, oh, he acted unethically, because it was a simple, straightforward, you know, case, but, but in the end, ethics sort of cuts through that, okay? Now, usually, um, ethics and, and, and modes of behavior are backed up by your... You know, societal networks, your religious beliefs, your political ideologies, your cultural backgrounds and whatnot. But I do want it to be very clear that ethics is the one thing that sort of cuts through all that. It also, in, in many ways, can cut through laws and regulations. I mean, laws and regulations are continuously updated to, to keep up with current trends and current uh, technologies and whatnot. That's very relevant to, to our field in engineering. But, you know, ethics doesn't need to be caught up, you know, they're, they're not laws and regulations that, that, that need to be updated. Ethics is consistent, okay? Um, <laughs> you know, where can you, where are some other places? Of course, you can get them from societies. I've posted NSP and ASCE codes of ethics. Now, if you're a mechanical engineer, you probably want to refer to mechanical ASME codes of ethics, IEEE for the electrical folks, uh, et cetera, and again, also state legislation. Um, what happens if you screw up? What happens if you violate your ethical responsibility? Well, a couple things can happen. Um, you know, first off, you know, you can lose your membership in, like if you're an ASC member or something like that, you can lose your membership. Um, you, they can publicize, hey, this happened and we are making notice of that, but it can sanction you. State legislation, you know, you can get probation, you can be fined, you can lose your license, and so on and so forth. These are um, real serious considerations that have to be taken into account. Um, you know, so real quick pop quiz, A, B, C, or D? I know it doesn't show that. But. Who's protected first? A, obviously, safety, welfare of the public. You know, who would be um, protected last? Well, who would be protected next? So I'd say the client, yeah. Your peer, you don't really work for them, though. You work for your employer. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right. Okay, so look. Some key rules to follow, and then we're going to talk about some cases. Oh, my goodness. We're going to talk about some cases. All right. Protect the public. Be objective. Be truthful. Be confidential with the uh, secrets of your client, your firm, be competent. Again, I'm not designing any wastewater treatment facilities. Um, uh, you know, try to avoid conflicts, you know, disclose everything uh, when, when appropriate, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's talk about the Pinto. I love this, this, uh, this image right here, which says, keep off my rear, I'm explosive. It's pretty relevant. No, no, like really explosive. So, 
<laughs> God. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Pinto. So the Ford Pinto was a, uh, a vehicle that Ford manufactured and was pretty popular throughout the 70s. And there was a, a design flaw, or not really a design flaw, I would say, bless you, but there was a design issue associated with the fuel system. In particular, the, um, the, the components that they used uh, it, with certain valves and, and locations within the fuel system uh, caused this vehicle to be susceptible under uh, high speed or under rear end collisions. The vehicle became susceptible to combustion and explosion. Okay. Now Ford was, became aware of this, um, and uh, in 1978, I believe it was, a memo got leaked, and the memo was essentially an internal study that was done at Ford. Uh, that uh, performed a cost-benefit analysis of the, uh, the issue associated with the Ford Pinto. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click this, uh, this link because I want to show you all this. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So here's the memo. This is the actual memo. Let me see if I can find it. Come on. This is the best, this is the part right here, okay? So um, what they did in their cost-benefit analysis is, it, and it, yeah, this is what we're talking about. This. They looked at the cost of repairing the issue, and they found that to repair the issue, it would cost about $11 per unit. And when they multiplied that times the estimated number of produced units, it came out to about $137 million. So to replace the part in the car and actually arrest the combustion issue, it came out to about $137 million. And then they said, well, what about the flip side? Well, they estimated that about 180 people would die, uh, 180 people would have serious burn injuries, and about 2,100 people uh, or 2,100 vehicles would sustain damage. They looked at a unit cost of that, and they said that it actually was more expensive to fix the issue according to just this little snippet. It was more important to fix the issue than it was according to what the public thought than to just let the people die. <laughs> now, <laughs> looks pretty bad, doesn't it? So, so they issued at the time what was one of the biggest recalls in automotive history at the time, and and yeah, that ultimately the car became. The, the car line became discontinued. Now, here's the interesting part, okay? Here's where, if we want to talk about objectivity, this is the interesting part, okay? The car was susceptible to r damage and explosions under rear end collisions. In other words, somebody slamming into the rear end of the car. From a vehicular travel standpoint, actually rear end collisions are among the most rare type of collisions that there are, you're usually having, you know, uh, you know, bumper collisions in parking lots and things like that. There was a few uh, 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 a study done uh, sometime in the 80s that looked at the Ford Pinto in a you know, at a 30,000 foot view and looked at the Ford Pinto um, in comparison with Volkswagen, Chevy, and other comparable, you know, subcompact to, to type vehicles, and found that while the Ford Pinto was more susceptible to damage in rear end collisions, all in all, in comparison to its other, its counterparts, the Ford Pinto was really no more dangerous overall than any other vehicle in its class that was currently on the market. Keep in mind, a car is a, is a, a, a cage of metal and fire, you know, carrying people down the road. Now that's a, an extreme way of, of, that's an extreme way of describing it, but I go back to my assessment of risk. There is no way to design a system that is not perfectly safe. There's always some level of risk. You want another uh, a little nugget of info about the Ford Pinto case, and this is what you probably don't know. This memo was a study that was submitted to the National Transportation Safety Board, okay, to assess this, okay. In this memo, they're using these numbers, these $200,000 numbers and whatnot. Where do you think they got these numbers? They got them from the National Transportation Safety Board. They were doing the study the way the government told them to. Now, 
you got to look at things a little more objectively, you know. I'm not saying that, let me say this. We, and, and here, okay, if we want to get, get technical, let's get technical, all right? One thing that I didn't, that, that I really do fault Ford uh, for in, from an engineer's perspective, there's only one way to fix the problem. You're telling me that there's not other alternatives that could be vetted, you know, different configurations of the vehicle, different materials for fittings and valves and what have you, that there's only one answer. That's it, one answer. As an engineer, I propose there's more than one answer and they maybe could have chosen door number two or door number three. That, that was sort of my issue as an engineer. There's more than one way uh, to fix this problem. They ultimately ended up did, uh, fixing it, but the product got recalled. From a um, uh, corporate malfeasance case, I mean, it, it's, it's, very, um, it's a very classic case. And, you know, the, the document is considered, the leak of that document is considered one of the worst corporate scandals in American history because of the reaction from the public. And, and I think, right, you know, uh, in some cases, rightly so. I mean, you know, we're engineers and we can understand technical, you know, those types of technical complex challenges, but not everybody can, okay? Um, you don't expect me to be an expert on, you know, the law or medicine or anything like that because that's not what I, I specialize in. When it comes to those issues, I'm an every person just like anybody else. So I don't really fault the public for that. Um, now here's another case, the Challenger. Anybody, everybody, I would think, has heard of this. So Challenger launched in extremely cold weather. Um, there was a, 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 a gasket ring that, that on the, uh, one of the boosters. It was brittle because it was so cold. Uh, now the designer of that particular gasket said, don't launch. It, they were worried. Now the management, which had engineers among them, said, may be true, but there's just not enough evidence, and there was a lot of pressure. You know, the term launch fever, which is considered a real thing among this community. I mean, when you get close to a launch, everybody gets pumped up and excited, and they didn't postpone it, and everybody died, you know? So I would argue that, that, that uh, ethical responsibilities were uh, neglected a little bit uh, on that day. You know, now, I, I bring this up. Uh, because I want you to sort of think about your case that I presented to you all in your homework assignment. I want to—I don't want uh, just yes or no answer, like should they have done something or not. I want specifics. Okay, um, you know, when were their concerns? What was the engineer's responsibility before the launch? What about when the uh, the engineer was overruled? Should the engineer have done something? You know, the the person who designed the gasket, the O-ring, uh, you know. The engineer was overruled. What do they take it a step further, or do they just rely on the fact that it's it's the management's call? They said no. Uh, what's that? I'm okay with first person. Actually, I'm okay with that. That's fine. Again, I want your argument to be well backed up. I'm actually not into. That's no big deal. I'm fine with that. Um, what duty does the engineer have? Should the, should the engineer have notified the next level of management? Should they have called a press conference? Should they have called the astronauts, the folks on the craft? There's not just a yes or no. I mean, what should they have done? You know, where, I mean, at what point, like, where does it stop? You know, where, does it stop at all? You know, I want you all to answer this, and I want you to investigate these canons of ethics and, and go into this. Okay. Now, let's talk about this case. I, I want to hear from you all. I want to shut up for a little bit. I want to hear from you. And we got, we got a couple of them. Right, we got two of them. All right, so this first one, I'll read it out. So we got an engineer who hires an equipment vendor who's not a PE uh, to develop plans and specs for a, uh, a, a small, like a package wastewater treatment facility. And now it's part of a big project. So essentially the engineer is subbing this out. Uh, now the engineer uh, has no experience in the design of wastewater systems. Um, and he got the, the, the specs from the vendor, he incorporates the, the plans, uh, the specs into his plans, which he seals and delivers to the client. I'm not going to ask what's right or wrong, I want some comments on it, just in general. I don't think you're supposed to seal anything that's not your own work. You're not supposed to seal anything that's not your own work. Well, you're supposed to accommodate the 
See, I, I don't want to say I, I don't want to challenge you on that a little bit, but um, what about when engineer A performs the calcs and engineer B checks the calcs? Okay, I'll talk to you and talk to you. Go ahead. No, okay, that's that's an interesting question. Now the uh, okay, now I have here that the engineer uh, seals and delivers this to the client. So I guess you can uh, safely assume that. Although there was a story here recently in the Washington Post about uh, an architect who had been hopping around from state to state and sealing stuff for years and never once had their license. It was, yeah, it was, this is a, this is a, I want to say it was in the Washington Post. I saw it on, online. It came out like a few days ago and I, and I read the article. It was really interesting. And, yeah. Yes, sir. The engineer hired somebody who didn't have the PE. Yeah. But what about what about the vendor though? What about the vendor? What, But the vendor does. Maybe the vendor is completely competent. Maybe the vendor developed, the, you know, created the whole system. What about the vendors? Anybody have anything to say about the vendors? Somebody else? Somebody haven't heard of? Heard from? Well, I'd argue that the vendor is designing stuff. The vendor doesn't have a license. So the, the, the vendor is performing design without a license. All right, you think that. What about anybody else? I want about, I mean, what's that? That's an interesting question. It's a question that would need to be answered. Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> I can't do that. That's just. I mean, it's an interesting point. I, I mean, we're, none of these things have yes or no answer. I just want to hear what you all think about it. So, but, okay, so let me ask you this, okay, so the, the engineer, the one who hired the vendor, the engineer shouldn't have sealed it because that person didn't know anything about it. But what if the vendor had a stamp? Then the vendor could say, well, this is my area of expertise. I stamped it. Can engineer, can the original engineer rely on that? No, no, they wouldn't know. I'm saying can the engineer who doesn't know anything about wastewater treatment design, could they rely on the vendor stamping it if the vendor had a stamp? But the vendor doesn't have a stamp. That's what I'm getting at. Yes. Well, here, here, here's the reason. Here's the reason why I bring that up. I mean, if you're working on the design of, like, the Burj Khalifa, there's no one engineer's stamp on everything. I mean, there's going to be the subcontract for. Uh, I mean, there's going to be stamps all over the place. There's going to be folks working on the geotech, folks working on the structures, but you know, architects. There's going to be, you know, different levels of approval across the board. I mean, even if it's just a building, at the very least, you're going to have architects and engineers stamping it. So what I'm getting at is 
and this is just sort of where I'm thinking everybody's here. The vendor, if the vendor had a PE and the vendor was approving the wastewater treatment facility, I'm asking if would the engineer be okay in employing that design in their project? That's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. That's a very interesting point. When I when I don't don't think of the the package part in terms of size. Think of the package part in terms of uh, like a cookie cutter wastewater treatment uh, process. Not something that's very very unique. Something that's very standardized. Again, it, it goes to whether or not he's competent in the area at all. There is something to be said. There is something to be said with that every project is different, right? No engineer is going to be an expert in every project that they've done before they've done it, because every project presents unique challenges. There is something to be said about that. That's just life. Told you this wouldn't be boring. This is good stuff. That's, you're probably right, yeah. According to the planning board, you know, Mr. Ryan made a certain comment that you weren't very confident to the uh, education facility. So this, this whole project was messed up from the start because the engineer shouldn't have even taken it. The engineer should have said, you should call this person. What? Well, can you, can you blame the client? Can you blame the client, though, for picking up the phone and calling an engineering firm and saying, hey, I need you to design something, and the engineering firm says, I can handle that. Is it the client's fault? Isn't, I would argue absolutely not, you know. They call the engineer because they need help, you know. All right, one more comment. I want to go on the next one. <laughs> you spent some time in an office. <laughs> you spent some time in an. <laughs> You've spent some time in an office. <laughs> Are there any other big comments? Because I want to move on to the next one. I want to. Um, I, this is the stuff I want you to think about when you're re reading your case, because your case is somewhat intricate, and there's. Again, I'm I'm just I'm I'm sort of hungry to see what you all come up with. I think it's going to be interesting. All right. Okay. Here's an interesting one. Okay. So, a small government client, uh, so maybe like a school board or something like that, has advertised a design build project uh, for a new school building on a site where several existing where there are several uh, other buildings. Now, prior to construction. Uh, of the existing buildings, uh, a geotechnical firm produced a report showing a serious threat of mine subsidence on the site. The client tells all the engineer, contractor, bid teams to disregard the earlier geotechnical report as they prepare their bids for the new project. <laughs> this one's interesting. All right, all right, hold on. We're going to, I see some folks like, Hold on, hold on. Who wants to go first? Okay, all right, I'm on, you go first, and then, then you. Okay, all right, all right. Now, okay, this, this is interesting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond to this a little bit, and I'm gonna purposefully kick back because I'm gonna play devil's advocate, and I want to see what everybody else thinks. And maybe I'll talk about you in the, the next one. First off, this is not a report looking at construction of a new building. 
This is a report on the existing building. So the existing buildings are already done. They're already there. They're hunky-dory. And the, the, according to this, the buildings right now are fine. Okay? That's point one. Point two, the client is not an engineer. And the, engin and the client may simply think, well, these buildings are fine. Why would there be? I mean, and the report is on subsidence with the existing building. Why would there be any problem with the new building? And the client, again, you're talking about, you know, hydrologic issues and all this. This is a state, this is a super, county superintendent. They're not an engineer. Can they be faulted for making a decision or should they even be making the decision to begin with regarding these technical issues? You know, so I'm, I'm opening up a can of worms I, that I, I want to open it. I want to hear what you all have to say. Let me talk to you and then you. Right. a good point. So now, is there responsibility on the client or the engineers and the contractors? Yes. And then you. So, so what I'm getting at, though, you're taking the technical route that just from a technical standpoint, something has to be done. Right. Okay. All right. And, and you might be right on that. Okay. And we're, we're going to explore this stuff. I want to hear what you had to say there. Possibly, very possibly. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. So, but does the client hold any responsibility at all? See. In, in my scenario where the client simply in their non-engineer brain said, well, this is a, first off, this is a report about the existing building. It's not a report about the new buildings, and we're not doing any work on the existing buildings. So the client is arguing that it's irrelevant. You know, the client's taking the position that, well, you're talking about uh, existing geotechnical issues over in Harris Hall, and this is the, you know, the Weisberg Engineering Building. That's not even the same thing, you know, but it's the same school complex. And, and there is something to be said. They are the client. They are the ones paying for everything. But... We're t I mean, I, what I'm trying to do is play devil's advocate every time I hear something because I really want to challenge you all. I want to hear from some other folks, some, some folks that haven't said anything. Um, Well, you're, you're bringing up an interesting point, and what I'll say is this. Typically, uh, in engineering projects in general, I mean, engineering, and particularly civil engineering, 
is a profession that here and there can be fairly litigious, okay? And if company A is working with company B, you can rest assured, I mean, if you put something in email, if you put something in writing, if you produce a report and it gets distributed, folks are going to hold on to it because if things wind up getting litigated upon down the road, that becomes exhibit A. So I would argue that once something is distributed and becomes public, or at least uh, active between the firms, if things get litigated upon down the line, there's a chance it's going to come out. Interesting point. You would. There'd be change order and you'd, there'd be justifications and all that down the line. And it would get messier. It would get messier. You know, change orders do not make the client happy. All right. One more. And I want, I want to bring up some other points. Mr. Scarberry, I have a question. Is this yeah. All right. Now, now, hold on. There's, there is a big elephant in the room that we're all ignoring. Um, I'm going to talk to Mr. Scarberry and I'll talk to Mr. Potter about this one. I want to talk about the firm, the geotechnical firm. What's their role in this? What's their responsibility in this? Like. What should they do? They're the ones that produce the report that's getting ignored. What should they do? So, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. When we, <laughs> this is a lecture on ethics, everybody. <laughs> Blackmail is not the answer. <laughs> I did, it's not what I meant when I said I'm playing devil's advocate. Um, um, what do you mean, let everybody know? Let, okay, so the geotechnical firm, um, let's say they produced that report and submitted it. I mean, what do, you, do, that, do they have a responsibility to independently contact each engineer and each contractor? Is that what you're saying? So you're saying that the firm doesn't have a response. Oh, what's that? Mr. Potter. I'm calling on everybody. Okay. All right. Hold on, I got a couple. Of, I want to talk? Yeah, you, you go ahead. Are they not in confidentiality? Like, would they not sign a form and tell them what the basis was? Maybe that's interesting. Maybe that's a good point. Maybe the, the findings of these re, this report's confidential. Hold on, hold on. What about responsibility to society with the firm? Right, no, I'm okay. What do you got? Is it? I mean, mine subsidence on a site? You're, what you're saying, Mr. Page is making the argument, oh, hell yes, it's causing a problem. That's a big problem. Let's talk about that, though. Okay, so what? What the? Dis I hear the discussion, and it's essentially saying that the public should know. How? 
Is that the right? Now hold on. Is that the right way to go? <laughs> Hashtag sad here. <laughs> no, but but okay. Let, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's discuss this. I mean, does the geotech firm send a rep down to the next school board meeting? That's an interesting. What if this is a report that they produced back in the 70s? Does the firm, is the firm still responsible for those findings? What about, what if, all right, hold on, hold on. What if the PE who sealed that report is dead? <laughs> Did you just say he found my shaft? <laughs> Well, in that regard, I'd say there's a problem. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got, we got. Go ahead. Yep, that is right. See, yeah. All right. There, there's a couple points that I want to make about this. Okay. I want to, I want to talk about our discussion and where our discussion has gone in the past 20 minutes. Now we went from, you know, the case to engineer falling down a mine shaft and and and. <laughs> And blackmail just to just to have some fun with it, but but I really want to make a really good point. Okay, when you first read this, when you first read it, what you see is the client told the engineer to ignore an, a safety issue on the site, and that just bad. You know, you know, you see red as an engineer, but then we start to unpack it and we go, well, who's responsible? Maybe there are other facts we're missing. Maybe there are some other issues that we're not considering. You know, we talked about, you know, people should be notified. Who gets notified? The public, the, um, the, the, the public, the, the, the school board, the, the engineers and contractors who bid. Who notifies? Is this the client? Is it the geotech firm? Everybody here agrees that there is a problem. Everybody here probably agrees that there are more facts that need to be ascertained. I mean, right here. So, a small government client advertised a design-build project for a new school building on a site with several existing school buildings, okay? Marshall is a site with existing school buildings, all right? Do we think that a geotechnical issue at the stadium affects the old engineering building? I'd argue no, you know. So right off the bat, well, we need a map. We need a site plan. Is it right next to it? Is it on a slope? Is it, you know, we're, you know, we start getting technical. And then we start getting into the responsibility issue. Is the client at fault? Are the engineers and contractors who bid it, are they at fault for not, a, you know, uh, 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 for ignoring the bid, I mean, the client told them to ignore the report. Maybe they shouldn't ignore the report. And we said, no, we are going to consider it because it's going to affect our bottom line. You know, I mean, what if you're the contractor and you say, oh, I'm going to get sneaky and I'm going to put that two million dollar bid, and then you get the project, you turn out, uh, you find out it's a problem, you put in a four million dollar change order, and the client says no. Now you're stuck doing the project at one hell of a loss, right? So. The point I'm getting at is I really want you to unpack these cases. I want you to unpack it, and I want you to come up with what you think is the appropriate strategy. Okay? The case that I gave you all is involved. There are a lot of details. There are a lot of players. I want you to digest it a little bit. I want you to think about it. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the people that are presented in that case. And I want you to write me a paper telling me what should happen. Okay? Now there is no real right answer or real wrong answer, okay? This is funny. I actually have this case here. 
and uh, I'm looking at the quote unquote solution and the solution was them taking this case and presenting it to a series of engineers. Here's the case and here are the answers that they came up with. Do you know what I mean? There are a host of different answers and different strategies. I'm curious to see what you all come up with. Okay. This is important stuff. I mean, the, the, uh, I think at least once in your career, you're going to be faced with an ethical challenge. It's going to happen, you know. I mean, it will happen to you. It's happened to me, you know. It, in all honesty, it wouldn't be ethical. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Put them down. Put them down. Put them down. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with you producing different strategies or different ideas. But I don't want just, well, they could do this, 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 and this. I say, well, this article or this canon of the specification says that this is important. So because of that, this is a strategy. But then there's also this aspect of the challenge or of the, the scenario that wasn't addressed. And maybe we need to talk about this canon of, of uh, ethics and so on and so forth. Again, I am fine with whatever argument that you choose to present as long as it's backed up by this, by one of the canons of ethics. So, I mean, and I do this not to, I mean, yeah, we have to satisfy ABET requirements to say that you all need to understand your professional and ethical responsibilities. But you all are going to face this, you know. I mean, you're going to face it even whether you become engineers or not. You're going to face ethical challenges in your life, and you need to understand how to critically assess it and, and make the best decision possible. You know, I'm not interested in presenting you all, you know, uh, uh, black and white ethical issue. I want the gray area really, you know, to be hammered in. I want you all to be able to take a complex challenge and come up with a strategy that you think makes sense. Okay. Again, I, I can't I can't emphasize this enough. I don't think there are really right or wrong answers with this. I just want to see what you come up with. First person, third person is fine. Multiple strategies is fine. Uh, different viewpoints is fine. Um, let me see. There's uh, the only uh, the only point is this. I do want to know what um, Julie should do uh, and why she should. I have a typo. That says he, but I do want to know what Julie should do. But if there are other players in the scenario that you think are worth discussing, discuss them. This is not the engineering assignment. Oh, good. This is not the engineering assignment that you expected. I'm clumsy. I'll be the first person to admit it. Um, yeah, this is the least, you know, calculation-based assignment I've ever given. But um, I think you all will maybe have some fun with it. You've got plenty of time on it. And again, it's not due for about a month. Okay, it's not due till October 11th. Don't forget about it. Yeah. Talk about it. Have fun with it, you know. But in the end, treat it seriously and come up with you think what you think is a serious response. Does that sound good? Okay. So here's our schedule again so that everybody is aware. We are not physically meeting next week. We are doing a, uh, a video lecture on corporate environments, on professional documents and professional behavior, stuff like that, things you need to be aware of in the workplace, you know. Uh, you know, things like chain of command, you know, you know stuff like that. Um, what, what are contracts? What's billability? What are time sheets? Stuff like that. Um, so I think that's something we can very easily cover in a video. So we won't meet next week. Week after, Drinko 402, and we will discuss Marshall Career Service Resources. That's all I got, guys. We'll see you all in two weeks. <laughs>